academic components that will allow us to advance in more research, training, education, community outreach uh, projects. So this institute was very newly established just November last year. And what we hope to see is in the future, in the year 2018, we will have a hub of healthcare services within this compound of what we call Novena Care Compound. And uh, NCID will be located, this is a National Centre for Infectious Disease that is targeted to be ready in the year 2018, will be surrounded by the whole range of different facilities, including Tantok Singh Hospital, including our ambulatory cluster, as well as the third medical school called LKC Medical School. For some of you, you may be getting more and more familiar with this school. This year is our first year with our first intake of medical students. And hopefully, you know, when the whole thing uh, is up and running in the year 2018, I truly hope some of you will end up, uh, you know, visiting us. And you, uh, well, I'll be, I hope I have the pleasure to bring you around in this uh, new building. Right, back to dengue. That's the reason why, you know, Singapore, we are focusing a lot of research and try to understand dengue. So this is the uh, general tr the trend of uh, Singapore over the many decades. So in the very early 50s and 70s, we see predominantly children with dengue hemorrhagic fever. And because of the uh, campaign of keeping environment clean and also imposing many of the uh, environmental rules and regulations, we're able to bring down the hospital breeding site significantly. And for two to three decades, we see very few dengue cases. However, in the late 90s, we're beginning to see this surge of dengue cases. And interestingly, the disease has now switched from predominantly childhood dengue hemorrhagic fever to adult dengue fever. So today we see predominantly adults with dengue fever and very few dengue hemorrhagic fever as you can see from here represented in the blue bar. Now this is very unusual year for us in Singapore. This year you know, we see a significantly high number of dengue cases throughout almost the entire year. So if you look at the year-to-year -year trending, usually you will see dengue cases around about middle of the year. So this will be our dengue peak year. This year, we saw very early dengue entry into the, uh, the, the community, very high uh, dengue cases during the regular dengue peak season, and yet it continued on. This year, even at the cooler month of the year, we continue to have more than 400 cases being reported uh, in Singapore per week. Now one of the reasons we thought that this significant change in terms of the number of dengue cases could be because of zero type switch and this will be the second time we experience and document the switch of the zero types giving rise to a significant epidemic. So here you can see round about March you can see a significant switch from a predominant dengue 2 to the coming up of dengue 1 and dengue 1 is now the predominant zero type in Singapore. However, this year again is rather unusual. In fact, we see dengue 2, dengue 3 in core circulations and a few cases of uh, dengue 4 uh, as well. So what I want to mention here is that uh, in addition, when you look at this huge number of cases, we ask ourselves, in the year 2004, 2005, when we experienced the big uh, dengue epidemic, we had 70 to 80 percent of the cases notified to have dengue fever uh, require hospitalization. Then we look at this year's our trend, only about 30% of fake uh, cases require hospitalization. Now there are many hypothesis reasons that we put up to explain why there is a significant drop of uh, cases that require hospitalization. Now, this is the age distributions. I think uh, a lot of you ask in terms of pediatric uh, dengue infections, uh, how is it like in Singapore? So you can see if I use up to the age of 14, you know, we just barely have these two small slices of pie uh, contributed by uh, children aged 14 and below. So predominantly we see adult dengue infection in Singapore and not only that, in the year 2011, one in five of the, the, of the notified cases, in fact age 55 and above. So in fact, we are seeing the age shift from childhood to adult and now moving into older population. And this is a very interesting uh, study that uh, was published by uh, Ministry of Health of Singapore where they look at the um, cohort surveillance, <coughs> cross-sectional cohort surveillance and they managed to capture this during the year 2004-2005 during our last big epidemic year. And when they run through the serum and we found that we have Singaporean age 55 and above, we still have 12% of them completely naive to dengue. 
and we have huge populations, 18 and below, 80% of them still never had a chance uh, to encounter dengue before. So in actual fact, in Singapore, because of the vector control program, we are pushing the infections to much later uh, and uh, into currently into the older uh, adult populations. But at the same time, we also figure that it is different in the sense that how the elderly patients present uh, compared to children and compared to the younger uh, adults. <clears throat> when we look at our own Eden data, which is a prospective data taken from the community, we found that our older patients, when you analyze them, they tend to have less aches and pain. Higher proportions of them came with comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, and, and, and things like that. I mean, this is something that is very common in our practice. In that particular cohort, community cohort, <clears throat> we did not see any significant increase in hospitalizations, comparing the, comparing the older individuals with uh, dengue, comparing to younger people. <clears throat> And then we thought, you know, to then utilize the WHO's uh, uh, 1997 as well as uh, 2009 uh, criteria uh, on probable dengue to apply on these uh, older individuals. And we found that whichever one you use, whether or not it is a 1997 or 2009 criteria, the, 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 the sensitivity of picking up probable dengue uh, in the younger age group all the way up to the middle age group, in fact, performs significantly well. But when we apply the same uh, criteria in the older individuals, we realize the sensitivity lags. So in other words, if I were to use the same set of criteria and apply it in a community setting, it is very likely that the sensitivity lags behind if I were to use that to make a diagnosis of probable dengue uh, in the elderly. So these are just of some of the challenges that we face in Singapore. We continue to see this cyclical dengue epidemic and we hope that one of these days we can fully understand and, and be able to uh, fully prepare for uh, the cyclical patterns and, and make sure we can attenuate that. We still have in Singapore large susceptible populations and including the older adults and we see predominantly you know, adult uh, dengue infections. Most likely is because of the uh, vector control program that have been put in place uh, for years and we see predominantly dengue fever and uh, not that many dengue hemorrhagic fever in the adult. But one of the things we've been asking ourselves is that of these, all these dengue cases, can we make a prediction? If you can diagnose them, can we predict who will eventually progress to dengue hemorrhagic fever? Who will then require to be hospitalized? And why is that there are some individuals that succumb to dengue infections regardless of the measures that uh, we put in place. So this is the research structure that we put up in the year 2008-2009. We brought together the clinicians, the laboratory uh, researchers, the epidemiologists, as well as the health service uh, researchers together and tried to ask these questions. Can we have innovative uh, prevention strategies to prevent infections? If that fails, can we make a diagnosis as early as possible? Can we then predict who likely will progress to severe disease? Is there interventions that we can provide to the patients? Can we achieve the best outcome? In, in, in today, you know, we still aim for no death uh, because of dengue. So this I took uh, from, modified from the WHO 209, <clears throat> looking at the entire cascade uh, of care uh, of uh, dengue cases. So it's important then in the primary setting that, you know, the, the physicians Taking care of the patients have the ability to suspect and make an early diagnosis of uh, dengue infections and be able to monitor them and identify those individuals likely will progress that require hospitalizations and already set up in a hospital to be able to handle them including adequate, uh, adequately trained laboratory support as well as staff to be able to handle situations like that and ICU care and ultimately what we want, the final outcome is for our patients to recover from the infections. So to a clinician, this is very common. Patients walk into our clinic, none of them can declare to you that they have uh, dengue infections and therefore you only need to follow them up as per dengue um, protocol. So a lot of times we have to go through our mind whether or not they are dengue or not. So this is one of the KAPB survey that I did uh, in Singapore from April to June 2011 and that was before the availability of NS1 uh, test kit at that, at that time. So the question posed to them was that how many GPs will spend money to test on the patients to make a diagnosis of dengue? In fact, only half of them were willing to do so because it carries costs, it incurred costs. And of those willing to do a dengue diagnostic test, three-thirds of them 
say that they will use serology tests. So in other words, whatever you do, it's actually a lack diagnosis rather than an early diagnosis. So because of that, then the research group, we thought to ourselves, can we now have something very simple that we can use, that we can present to our general practitioner in the primary health care, something very easy, something quick, and even at the same clinic setting, they will be able to tell their patients uh, the outcome uh, of the result. This is what we call point of care test. And indeed, we did that uh, in our own setup in, 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 in my own uh, research hospital. Okay. So this is what we did in a tertiary hospital, the place where I work. Uh, we, we have a clinic, uh, it's a febrile clinic. And for febrile patients with an undiagnosed uh, febrile illness, we subject them through this test and we apply this very simple test, uh, which is a dual cassette uh, test using the SD bio line with NS1 as well as the IgM, IgG reading uh, on them. And we did it on site in the clinic. Using the combinations of NS1, PCR, IgM, IgG, uh, compared to the combinations of uh, NS1, PCR, IgM, IgG, but also utilizing the IgM, IgG as part of a composition of a diagnosis, we found a sensitivity of 94% and 92% specificity. So in other words, at this point in time, we are quite confident that a point of care test, very simple to use, can be used, can be done by my nursing staff in the clinic, will be able to provide this information to the patients in a very short period of time. So that information was rolled out to the primary healthcare, uh, ensure that the primary physicians now understand that this such test kit uh, became available. Uh, not only that, we also work very closely with uh, the producer to roll out some of the free test kit for people to get uh, familiar with. So what happened this year when we had a dengue search? Many of this clinic now ask to have this test to be done. Many of the clinic may not be able to do this test or willing to do this test, but this test is now freely available also by our Environmental Health Institute. So the turnaround time is very short. Within half a day, one day, the patients and clinicians both will be able to receive the information of whether or not they are tested positive. Now in dengue management, as a clinician in, in a hospital setting, it's very common for us to receive patients at this stage, right? This is day eight of patients. And when I receive a patient at this stage, in fact, even my medical students first year will be able to tell me the diagnosis. If not, they will fail because it's so classical. It's classically, this is a patient with uh, eight days of illness with very classical dengue rash. Right. <clears throat> so in, as, as well as in this patient, right? Very nice uh, dengue rash that is uh, very generalized. You can see some puffiness here, uh, and I think uh, it's possibly a little bit overzealous uh, intravenous uh, infusion. Now, this is the patients where I've been uh, teaching my students because of the non-specific nature of dengue, particularly day one, day two, day three. And for many of the general practitioners, the quick fix for the patient is IM injection. And many of the patients will end up in my clinic after the IM injections, a huge hematoma. And if you run the platelet count, in fact, they are very low. So those, those are the early dengue infections where you know it can it can be better managed without having this complication. So for that reason, we decided to educate our primary healthcare practitioner, make them uh, be aware of the rapid test kit with a very quick turnaround time, and uh, let them use them. So after that, you know, they are able to make the diagnosis of uh, dengue infections. The next thing we need to work with them is for them to identify who likely will progress to severe disease and who will require admissions. So this is the 1997 uh, uh, recommendations, effectively looking out for plasma leakage with the recognition of hypovolemia. So effectively, you can see from here, it's just the tachycardia, pulse rate, and, and the complications because of hypovolemia uh, that are being recommended to be admitted to the hospital. In 2009, however, if you look at the admission criteria, it mentioned warning signs. Uh, any patients with warning signs should be admitted. And if you look at the next uh, table, you will see that when you admit the patients, put them on a drip. So that has been a point of being picked up by many of the managing team to ask these questions. Must I admit every patient with warning signs? Must I admit every patient and infuse them with fluid when they come into the hospital? So this is a test, uh, one study that we did. And as of now, we have collected uh, about 10,000 caseloads from the year 2004 to 2009. And it's still ongoing. 
looking at the very well standardized structure of treatment that we provide to the patients with uh, structure recording. And this is, although retrospective, but in fact, many of the data is already very pre well designed and, and structurally uh, collected. Then we look at 1,000 over of them with uh, PCR confirmed dengue infections from the period 2004, 2007 to 2008, stretched over two different uh, serotypes uh, period. And we found that uh, of these, at least 52% of them had warning signs. So in other words, warning signs, even in, the, in these populations that we have in, in the hospital, is something very common. Uh, and, but unfortunately, there are many of them, by the time they hit the hospital, they're already in a severe uh, disease state. With all these information, we look at the warning signs and ask ourselves, <coughs> Uh, mucosa bleeding is the uh, the most common warning signs of all, and in this cohort, at least two thirds of them uh, presented with a warning signs. Mucosa bleeding is the most common, and then we look at the compositions of them. Uh, how many of them just with one warning signs, and how many of them with two, and how many of them with three warning signs? So in this cohort, if you look at dengue hemorrhagic fever, about 22.4% uh, of them had at least three warning signs. But if you look at the severe disease, we have also about 21%. So if you look at those individuals with more than three warning signs of this cohort, at least one-fifth of them had uh, more than uh, three warning signs uh, together. But what is more important is that when we start running individual warning signs, we found that none of the warning signs is specific enough to make a prediction. Although some of the warning signs may be very sensitive, but they are not predictive enough uh, in predicting disease uh, progressions. But more importantly is the negative finding. We found that of those individuals completely without any warning signs, the negative predictive value is almost 96% of them would progress to severe disease. So in other words, if any of the patients without warning signs, the likelihood of them progress to disease is very, very minimal. Right, so we did two. We, we look at the final outcome using dengue hemorrhagic fever and we use outcome uh, of a severe, di severe disease, severe dengue disease. And for those, of, for those uh, definitions of outcome, uh, we found very similar things. In other words, without warning signs, very rarely they will progress to dengue hemorrhagic fever or severe disease. So we thought that kind of information we need to be confirmed by doing a prospective study. And we did this pros prospective study from January 2010 to September 2012, utilizing the same set of uh, a clinical setting as I mentioned earlier on when we did the POCT test. And we enrolled patients with, uh, with uh, undifferentiated uh, uh, fever. And then we analyzed those patients with a confirmed PCR positive and NS1 positive in, in this uh, febrile cohort. <coughs> and again, we found very similar uh, clinical fi finding. Mucosa bleeding is the most common warning signs. However, none of the warning signs, again, specific enough to predict disease progressions. But what is more important, again, it shows up negative predictive value of 100%. So in other words, for those individuals never had warning signs throughout the entire course of clinical illness, very rarely they will progress to severe disease outcome, either using dengue hemorrhagic fever or, de or severe disease. And then looking at those individuals that progress, uh, presented to us early enough and progress with the warning signs and progress to dengue hemorrhagic fever, a majority of them, in fact, from the occurrence of warning signs to the uh, diagnosis of dengue hemorrhagic fever is about a day. So in other words, it's actually quite short. And our study again concur with the other publication as well in terms of the occurrence of warning signs to the progressions of uh, severe outcome. So in other words, the window of opportunity for interventions may be short. <clears throat> So to sum up uh, our, our findings so far, uh, we realized that the absence of warning signs predict very nicely the lack of uh, disease progressions to severe disease. However, the presence of uh, warning signs, especially the single warning signs, are just very common. And we also realized that, uh, I'm very sure all of you will agree with me, dengue is a dynamic disease, the day-to-day, -day, in fact, hour-to-hour -hour changes. <coughs> The time from onset to warning signs to the onset of severe disease, in fact, uh, is, is very, very short. So because, you know, we see a lot of adult patients, it may be quite different from many of the uh, pediatricians here that handle pediatric uh, cases. So I thought I'd just share with you uh, some of our cases. Now, this is very common. Almost every day, we will see a few cases like that. 
57-year-old male patients, uh, underlying disease of hypertension, the entire course of disease, he ended up with a severe uh, dengue, uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever. He came in day five of clinical illness, was really complaining of pain, so his pain score was very, very high. Uh, he was hemodynamically stable uh, at this point in time. He came in with a total weight of 2006, platelet count of 27. On the second day of hospitalization, he beginning to show him hemodynamic changes. You can see his blood pressure is dropping at this point in time. So anti-hypertensive medication was stopped uh, at this point in time. And his temperature, as you can see, follow very nice uh, classical patterns of uh, fever. Uh, his fever defervesce somewhere around day 7, day 8 or so. Together with that, you can see a drop of platelet count to 5,000 and to 5,000 and subsequently picked up to 19,000. But what is more important, you can see the dynamic changes of the hemodynamic status. So at this point in time, which is a critical phase, you can see his blood pressure, in fact, almost touching 20 millimeters uh, uh, mercury uh, at this point in time. And then you can see with that, his uh, volume again expanded. Now what is more important here is that we see so many of these cases. They come in, we stop their antihypertensive medications. We have to ask ourselves, how long do we need to stop their hypertensive medications? When should, we have, when should I reinstitute? Now this patient is an inpatient. I can do my daily monitoring. If these patients will be the outpatients, how frequent must I call back my patients to monitor their blood pressure or to reinstitute antihypertensive drug? So this is uh, something that we have done, again, using our own uh, uh, thousand caseload cohort to look into day-to-day -day trending uh, of uh, blood pressure. And here I split them into two groups, uh, the elderly one, which is uh, something like 4% in the entire cohort, uh, compared to the entire cohort. If you look at a fever day, most of them will have the lowest daily minimum systolic blood pressure, around about seven, day 7 of clinical illness. By day 8, day 9 or so, you can see the recovery uh, of uh, blood pressure. By the time they are afebrile for about day 3, day 4, day 5, normally their blood pressures will almost go back to their baseline. So I thought this would be the information uh, very useful for me to guide myself as well as my students in terms of the daily monitoring of these cases and when to reinstitute some of the medications that they used to be on before uh, they contracted the uh, dengue. <coughs> There's one slide missing. Okay, so there's one slide missing, unfortunately. I don't know where it went to. Um, this is a 70-year-old Chinese lady. Came to us day two of febrile illness. Noted to have tea color urine, ill-looking, and she was admitted to the hospital. Uh, because of her findings of... Uh, see color urine, look a bit jaundiced, naturally we focus our attention on the hepatobiliary system. So she had ultrasound done and this is what we call MRCP, she had a scope done, she had a stone removed, confirmed hepatobiliary sepsis uh, with, uh, with the stone in there and the third hospital day, there, she had her total white, whoop, on the third hospital day, her total weight was uh, 8,005, her polymorph 91, still very much the kind of bacteria kind of picture. But her platelet count now dropped to 92. So it became quite a reflex action in my hospital right now. Anybody with thrombocytopenia, anything 100,000 and below, they just sent off a dengue uh, test. So this test was sent off, the dengue test was sent off, but at the same time, her blood culture came back E. coli. So it fits very nicely, hepatobiliary sepsis, stone, and E. coli bacteremia. But at the same time, this also came back. Now she has NS1 positive, dengue IgM, IgG negative. So it caused quite a fair bit of stir at the point in time, uh, asking the infectious disease physicians to interpret this information. Did she or did she not have dengue at that point in time? Right? <clears throat> I don't know. What, did, what is your take? All right. So then, you know, we, we had we done a few things. Uh, we decided to, you know, follow it, follow up as, as usual. You know, her total weight dropped from 19,000 to 3,000. <clears> and uh, classically, the, uh, the platelet count dropped uh, along with her temperature as well. So we decided to just go ahead and send her test for PCR. And she was PCR positive and uh, confirmed dengue type 3 infections. So again, this is a patient with uh, bacteremia. 
At day two of clinical illness, she was admitted to the hospital. She was detected HNS1 positive, where nobody can believe. They did the test and they cannot believe the test. And then uh, we confirmed it uh, with dengue type 3. So I believe that as the dengue moved into the elderly populations in Singapore, we will beginning to encounter many of these cases uh, in the future. So if I have time, I'll just quickly walk through. <clears throat> so in Singapore, May this year, we encountered our very first dengue death. Believe me, this all taken from the newspaper. And it spread over a few days. So in other words, one dengue death in Singapore is equivalent to a lot of story that can be told. And you can, you can read it uh, over you know, the, the public uh, in the newspaper. So it's quite a tragic in terms of a young man, only 21 years old, succumbed to dengue infections. So in Singapore, this is our patterns of mortality. Pediatric dengue infection in Singapore, very unusual. And we combine five public hospitals over five years, and these are the number of uh, dengue deaths that uh, we have. So we found total 28 uh, dengue cases that are confirmed PCR NS1 positive. You can see it's mostly the older folks that actually succumb to uh, dengue infection. <coughs> And the median age in these particular studies are all age 55, uh, and three out of four had the pre-existing comorbidity. And then we look back and we found that at least almost all of them had at least one warning sign. So warning sign is very sensitive. Unfortunately, it is not specific in guiding who you know would likely progress uh, to to severe disease. Subsequently, we did uh, a few uh, dengue mortality studies uh, in Singapore, uh, mostly all uh, adult patients, uh, and we found some common factors such as uh, GI bleeding, organ failure, particularly kidney failure, alter mental status, uh, and liver involvement. <coughs> and many of them also were entered into uh, shock as well. Okay, so um, I will end my presentation here, and just give you a quick summary of some of the issues that we face in uh, managing dengue uh, in Singapore. And uh, these are all my collaborators under the uh, Stop Dengue Studies, uh, where we uh, have uh, at least close to 10 different research institute, institutions coming together to try to uh, crack some of the uh, uh, issues uh, with uh, dengue. And I certainly hope that uh, one of these days uh, I can receive you in either this place, which is the place where we work, or in the future I'll be able to receive you in this place in the new Center of, for, for Infectious Disease in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Liu Yasin. Very good presentation. We are going to the next presentation. Uh, we'll present by Professor.